Shalom Aleichem. I'm Ann Toback, the CEO of The Workers' Circle, a social justice organization that builds progressive Jewish identity through Jewish cultural engagement, Yiddish language learning, multi-generational education, and social justice activism. I want to welcome you to today's afternoon program, Berenice, an actress in occupied Paris. At the Worker's Circle, we meaningfully connect to and celebrate the thousand years of Yiddish life, high culture, and tradition that are part of the legacy and Yerusha passed to us by our Eastern European immigrant founders. Today, we work to enable our members to literally touch our history during our Jewish journeys to Lithuania and Poland and in events such as this one, where we connect to our rich tradition of culture, activism, and resistance. Our goal is to bring us all closer to the lost world of the Pale of Jewish Settlement, a world that continues to resonate and inspire our Jewish identities today. In this afternoon's program, we will connect around a fictional story of resistance during the Holocaust that illustrates the terrible times and life-threatening challenges that existed for European Jews just 75 years ago. To moderate today's program, I'm pleased to introduce Dan Opatashu, a Yiddishist, active student in the Workers' Circle Yiddish Language Program, and a member of the Workers' Circle Board of Directors. As a child, Dan was cradled in the world of Yiddish culture. His grandfather, Joseph Opatashu, was a renowned Yiddish author and activist. And his father, David Opatashu, started out as an actor in Yiddish theater at the age of 16 and continued on to a successful career as a stage and screen actor. Dan's own credits include a 20-year career in screenwriting, teaching as a college professor, and serving as the executive director and on the board of Yiddish Kite LA. He has also served on the board of the Friends of the Vilnius Yiddish Institute. Welcome, Dan. Uh, welcome, everybody. Elanis, 1934 to 44, an actress in occupied Paris, is about a young woman who defies her Jewish family to become the leading actress in the Comédie Française, France's most renowned theater, right when the Nazis occupy France. Living in a world without tolerance and torn between two men, Berenice fights valiantly to pursue her passions. This novel celebrates the strength and talent of a remarkable Jewish woman and the significance of a strong community. Through the eyes of its young protagonist, we experience Jewish solidarity within the Kappel family and Armée Juive resistance group and the shared dreams that unite Berenice's classmates and theater troupe members. I look forward to speaking with Berenice's author, Isabel Stieb, and its translators, Rene Morel and Zach Rogo. But first, I'll introduce Danielle Levin, who will perform some excerpts from Berenice. Danielle is a San Francisco Bay Area-based actor and dialect coach. She's performed with Marin Theater Company, Shotgun Players, Crowded Fire, Aurora Theater Company, San Francisco Playhouse, Theater Works, Word for Word, among others. Danielle is an associate artist with Theater First, Symmetry Theater Company, and Playground San Francisco. Welcome, Danielle. Berenice, 1934 to 1944 an actress in occupied Paris. At the start of the novel, a baby girl is born to the Kapaluchnik family, now Capel. They've changed their name to sound more French. The family are working class Jews in the fur trade in Paris. Berenice is named for the heroine in a play by the great French playwright Racine in honor of an army buddy of Berenice's father, Maurice. The army buddy used to quote from the play in the trenches before he was killed in World War I. <clears throat> what do you want to be when you grow up, Berenice? An actress. An actress? Oi, Gavolt, 
Monsieur Capel objected. An actress? That's no profession for a Jew. Have you ever seen a Jewish actress? Greta Garbo, does she look Jewish to you? That's not a job for us. What about Rachel? Wasn't she Jewish? Grandma Mathilde said the bait. Rachel, Rachel, that's ancient history. But, Papa, why isn't it a profession for us? Those actresses are all shiksas. How do they say it? Every one of them is a cooker. I think you mean hooker, Maurice, observed Grandma Mathilde with her deadpan humor. That's what I meant, hooker. My daughter is not a hooker. Theater is all well and good, very high tone. Hassin is a great man, but it's not for my daughter. My daughter is going to be like nice French girls from good families. She's going to go to a lycée, not the local elementary school, mind you, a lycée. Then she'll become a teacher or a lawyer. A teacher is better. It's more decent for a girl than spending time around the thieves and murderers. Then she'll marry a good Jew, and they'll give me lots of beautiful grandchildren. You think you're going to have children if you're an actress? What kind of normal husband would marry a woman who kisses other men on stage? What Jew would want a wife who sleeps with directors to get parts? A Shonda, a shameful girl. Everyone agreed. Case closed. Sometimes a person who was not from a, a, a family member, a neighbor, or even Grandma Mathilde persisted in acting, in asking, why do you want to be an actress? I want to act. I want to be famous, Berenice answered spontaneously. Now that was Grandma Mathilde's favorite moment. Famous? Landru is also famous. The girl looked daggers at her, wounded by that sacrilegious comparison. Landru, a serial killer? She talked art, and her grandmother answered with crime. Adults were always asking the stupidest questions. Did she know why she wanted to be an actress? Do they ask water why it's wet? The real question was why everyone else did not want to be an actor. Or maybe grown-ups were just lying. Frankly, who didn't want to appear on a movie screen with a beautiful face in black and white? Could a school teacher aspire to that? Better to die than work in a humdrum job, Berenice pr promised herself. She would be a star. The great Berenice Capet. More sassy than Louise Brooks. More divine than Greta Garbo. More of a femme fatale than Marlena Dietrich. It's now 1934, and Berenice is old enough to audition for the conservatory that trains actors for the Comédie Française, France's leading classical theater. Her parents vehemently oppose this career. Through a wealthy client who buys furs from her father, Berenice connects with a celebrated actress, Vera Corrène, from the Comédie Française. Vera Corrène tricks Berenice's parents into allowing the girl to at least try out for the conservatory, saying that Berenice is sure to fail at the auditions, so she'll get acting out of her system. Berenice attends the audition with her friend Colette, who goes along to support her. one classic scene and one modern scene. That's what Berenice had to perform at the November entrance competition. She didn't have a partner, but she was assured she could find one that day, a second or third year student who could give Berenice her cues. What text to choose? Vera Corrin had suggested scenes from Don't Fool with Love and Iphigenia that lent themselves to virtuoso performances. Great classics with material that can shine even without experience. But be careful, it's all or nothing. A good reading can win the day. On the other hand, the jury can be more severe with these showstopper bits that they've heard a thousand times. Watch out for the bell ringing. The bell ringing? Berenice learned that the jury could use that to stop a candidate's performance, sometimes after only one verse. The bell meant they showed you the door. 
four months to prepare without ever taking a course or attending a class at the conservatory or following the custom of the aspiring actor presenting a scene in front of each of the professors to get their suggestions before the competition for admission. Berenice only had Vera Coren, her few directions, her own will to succeed, and her faith in her lucky star. After all, to get here, Papa somehow crossed Russia almost entirely on foot, she sometimes told herself for encouragement. Finally, that Monday in November 1934 arrived. The day of the competition for admission to the conservatory. Approximately 200 candidates were there to try their luck, just as she was. The number actually reassur reassured her. So she wasn't alone in being drawn to this profession. Mothers accompanied their children, smothering them with, with, them with, a, with suggestions, straightening their limp collars, taming their rebellious hair. Neither their mother, her mother nor her father had made the trip. Only the indispensable Colette was there to support her friend. She was the one who had counseled her on what she should eat in the morning to avoid sudden fatigue. She was the one who had loaned her the outfit that she declared appropriate for an audition, a black skirt topped by a pale blue blouse that brought out her large, light eyes. She was also the one who did her hair. And Berenice didn't realize how much her black hair with the virginal part in the middle made her look like a Madonna. Yes, a painting by Leonardo except for her nerves, far from the serenity of young Italian virgins. In the great commotion, it was Colette again who succeeded in finding a student to give Berenice her cues. A second year pupil, he introduced himself, proclaiming with a military air, name, Robert Manuel, age 19, profession, second year student. Please to meet you, mademoiselle. His beaming face and his social skills spurred Colette to ask him to help Berenice. He accepted without hesitation, hoping after the audition to share at least a coffee with the two young ladies. Honey, let me fill you in, he began. But Berenice ran to the women's room for the third time that morning and threw up what remained of the cafe au lait and croissant in her stomach. <sighs> when she reappeared in the entrance hall, <sighs> saturated with sweat and nerves, Colette looked for her concern. One more ahead of you and then it's your turn. Panicked, Berenice hurried into the small space that served as a waiting room. Her hands were cold and clammy. Her fingernails had turned purple. Through the half open door, she caught a glimpse of the room where the competition was taking place. A promised land she was so happy to gain entrance to, despite her stage fright. Her turn, catastrophe. Just before her entrance on stage, the announcer mixes up the names and the title of the play in a hot mess. Don't fool with the stove by Alfred Manuel, with Berenice Musset and Robert Capet. She is appalled by the announcer's frivolous tone, which to her is a high crime and misdemeanor of the theater. With a squeeze of the hand, her comrade tries to make her understand that she shouldn't worry, chiding himself for not having warned her that the announcer often made that sort of blunder as if the immense horseshoe-shaped table where the renowned actor-director Louis Jouvet was seated was not imposing enough. Who had the right to be so sloppy when she was staking her whole life on this role? What a nightmare. The muddle caused by the announcer makes the jury smile. She hears their stifled laughter. She spots their mocking glances. The outsized mouths of the members of the jury are drawing near her in a frightening way. They spit at her, in her face, their bursts of sardonic laughter making fun of her right before her eyes. All is lost. They aren't taking her seriously. They're gonna send her packing. 
Tell her that her place is not here, but in the first shop with her father, Maurice Capel. She can already hear the bell. Ding, 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 ding. Can't be. She hasn't done this for nothing. The Comédie Française sticker on her binder whirls before her eyes. And then she stands up straight, disdaining their laughter, so out of place within these sacred walls. With authority, she lets fly the first words. Lift your head, Perdican! Who is the man who believes in nothing? Not one of them thought again of laughing. At the end of these two scenes, the emotion that seizes her is so violent that she can no longer see anything, hear anything. She isn't aware of the surprised expression of her partner. She can't plumb the depths of the jury's silence. She can only think one thing. They didn't ring the bell. Berenice returned to Colette downhearted. Complete disaster. First, the mess with the announcer, and then at the emotional climax, she was out of breath. And besides, she had noticed a member of the jury, who before that had remained unmoved, jotting down a few lines in his notepad. They killed me. It's all over. Robert Manuel tried to reassure her. Dear girl, number one, this isn't the first time the announcer has made a mistake like that. We're so used to it, I didn't even think to warn you. Number two, I assure you, you were superb, a true tragedian. I wanted to be a tragedian, but look at me. I have the soul of Hamlet, but the mouth of Scapin. I just have to accept it. I was born to make people laugh. And in the end, it's harder to make them laugh than to make them cry. In any case, you, you have the temperament and the looks. I'm not even talking about your voice, which is made for tragedy. You give the verse its fullness. It flows like honey. Poor Robert. He was trying so hard to convince her. She only remembered the flaws in her performance. She went too fast over what is the world. She suddenly recalled having said, my whole entire life is on my lips instead of my whole life is on my lips. But her new friend wasn't lying to her. He wasn't trying to flatter her, to console her. He knew, even with only a year's experience, he knew that she had them eating out of her hand. He knew that her pale beauty, her noble pride, her poetic presence, her musical voice, her inventive acting had pulsed blood into the proud Camille. Of course, he also knew how arbitrary this competition could be, even unjust. There were so many other candidates. And the girl with her ingenuity and wild streak was disconcerting enough in the way that she stood out, enchanting as it was, to displease the more conservative judges. The minutes ticked away. The wait became more and more nerve wracking. And finally, the moment of the results, the doorkeeper posting the list, the rush to the bulletin board, the happy few selected, looked on with admiration, envy, or hatred. Berenice was admitted. Her name at the top of the list. I told you you were a hit, Robert Manuel trumpeted. They clapped for her. They gave her an ovation. Colette cried with joy. They hugged her hard enough to break every bone. They practically carried her in triumph on a chair like a Jewish wedding. The young fiance with the sapphire eyes and the face of a Madonna had just married the theater. With all her fervent youth, she swore fidelity to her lord and master, the theater. Today, this red letter day, her true birthday, this virginal day, inauguration day, she sealed her union with the stage, for better or for worse. But there couldn't be a worse in the theater, she thought, muse of the theater. I pledge myself to you until death do us part. I'm taking the oath. I am all yours. And if I forget, 
May my right hand forget her cunning. May let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth if I no longer think of you, if I don't put theater above all other joys. You're one of the gang now, Robert Manuel declared more prosaically. She was admitted at the top of the list. All hopes are permitted. Top of the list. Her life begins. She just had to go to the cafe to celebrate her victory with Robert Manuel, Colette, and a few of the other admitted students, her new friends, who had also been admitted. She had bonded with them in the blink of an eye. Her heart was brimming with joy. Even in her wildest dreams, she hadn't imagined that the universe of the theater was so full of joy. The anecdote so juicy, the one about Julie, the daughter of a famous actor, born at 10 minutes to eight, just before the curtain went up, so that she could be passed to her father to hold right before his entrance. How incredibly different from the conversation with her family or her parents' friends. What a new world, Rue de Madrid. Here, camaraderie was king and foretold horizons filled with promise, where you were no longer ashamed to, to give your life over, to lay bare your doubts, qualities, or faults, and then make fun of them, to speak loudly, to say you loved each other and you loved your happiness. Night began to fall and she had to leave this new paradise that welcomed her as the first among their own. She had to go back home and all the way home zigzagging, bumping against passersby several times, holding back from screaming with joy. She was tortured by thoughts of whether to reveal her joy to her parents or to fool them into thinking she had failed. Damn it all. Her intoxicating happiness made her abandon all prudence. Maybe she also wanted to prove to her parents that she had been right to insist. She didn't suspect that the words she was about to speak would weigh heavily in her life. I was admitted at the top of the list, she announced to them radiant. No need to proclaim her success. It was written on her face, a glorious face, luminous with joie de vivre and faith in the future, the glorious face of the chosen. In the ranks of historic wrath, the wrath of Maurice Kapoluchnik, son of Abraham Kapoluchnik, furrier by profession, and of Miriam Rabinovich, housewife, must have more or less equaled the wrath that came over Moses when he discovered his people worshiping the golden calf. You are not going to the conservatory. It's out of the question. Ashonda. Your mother and I sacrificed so you could go to a lycée. We bought you all the books you asked for. You didn't want for anything. That wasn't so you could throw it all away lightly on a childish whim. Papa, this isn't a childish whim. Theater is my life. Your life? What do you know about life at 15, you little shit? 15? is plenty old enough. Grandma Mathilde was already married at my age. Don't talk back to your father. Married? Look at her, you squeeze her nose and milk comes yeah. out. Your grandparents must be spinning in their graves. Those books of yours must have stuffed your head with weird ideas. You're a slut. Cursed be the day we named you Berenice. When we are dead and buried, you'll regret this. It was even worse when Maurice Capel understood the trick that Vera Corinne had played on them. It was too much for him. This was truly the proof that actresses are worthless, respect nothing, not even the honor due to their parents. On stage, they revel in honor and lofty sentiments, but in real life, actors are worthless, absolutely worthless. Is this what we raised you for? You're not going to the conservatory. It's not a profession for a Jew. I've told you that a hundred times. Then I prefer not to be Jewish. A slap! A resounding slap. With so much force, it made her stagger. 
I never would have believed I'd hear that from the mouth of my own daughter. That's how we raised you. I barely escaped getting killed by the Cossacks. I lost my whole family before I came here. The world is full of anti-Semites who only want to get rid of us and Mademoiselle prefers not to be Jewish. Are you forgetting who you are? My little one, remember well what I'm about to say to you. You don't choose to be Jewish. It's something you carry in you. It was the first time that Monsieur Capel had ever slapped his daughter. Berenice intuitively understood that the force he put into that slap was not just the physical violence of a man pushed to his limits. It was the entire weight of the lack of understanding between father and daughter, formerly so closely allied. The disappointment of a father who had imagined a different life for his only daughter, a more banal life, assuredly, but decent and without risk, something completely different from this Schnorr's profession that was not even a profession. Deeply wounded, she showed herself to be even prouder, unless it was her survival instinct that took over, that made her act. Stand up straight and look her father right in the eyes, without a tear, even if that cost her. Resolved to stand up to him, sensing that she had to, that it was now or never, that from now on she had to rebel, had to take the consequences, whatever they might be, because no punishment would be as bad as not being able to act. Her mother, beside herself, tried clumsily to separate them, putting between them her weak body and the arguments of another era. My God, stop it. What will the neighbors think? This discussion is over. Good night. Of course, Berenice didn't sleep that night. Of course, the next morning at breakfast, her first words were about the conservatory. If you go to the conservatory, you are not my daughter. I'm going. She was surprised that her father didn't scream at her. He said nothing which was more worrisome than anger. Something was brewing, but what? Not receiving a response, Berenice left the room to get ready. When she came back, dressed and with her hair combed, it was when she took her purse off its peg that she started to understand. She was almost certain that she hadn't left her purse like that when she came home the previous night. She wasn't completely sure because she had been in such an emotional state for the last 24 hours, but even so, she wasn't in the habit of leaving the flap of her purse half open. She glanced inside, obviously. She walked back to her father. Did you take my wallet? Absolutely. Just try to leave without any money and without your ID. Are you forgetting you're a minor? She opened the door. I don't give a damn. I'm going. You're staying here, he screamed, positioning himself between her and the door. Stop, cried her mother, trying to separate them. It's like a scene out of Fado, thought Veronese, who took advantage of the confusion to leave. Outside, the winds of freedom were blowing. Outside, the world was red and gold. You cursed child, I disown you. Don't you ever set foot in here again. A shame to our family. A shame on you. Rip! The sound of torn fabric, the traditional gesture of mourning the dead. She left, slamming the door behind her. She left in order not to have to see anymore the torn jacket. She left in order not to hear the sound of the fabric, to obliterate it with a racket of the door slamming. She had never thought of an article of clothing that, that, that could make so much noise. She left in order not to hear any more of the terrible insults that her father unleashed on her. She left in order not to retain the vision of her father in his rage. She left in order not to tarnish the image of her father that she wanted to keep intact, despite the misunderstanding that separated them. She ran till her heart felt it would split apart. She took the stairs four at a time, not fast enough not to notice the curious stares of the neighbors watching her leave, not fast enough not to hear the whispers commenting on their argument. 
She guessed her mother would be in a panic about the scandal for the neighbors who didn't miss one word of the argument with those walls as thin as cigarette paper. Her mother would end up making excuses to put a good face on it. The girl ran without stopping to the rhythm of the high-speed thoughts hurtling through her head. What to do without money? She didn't even have enough for a metro ticket. She ran to the home of Colette, who would surely lend her a bicycle and a 10 franc bill. There would be time later on to think about how to survive. She ran faster and faster as if her life depended on it. She couldn't be late for the conservatory. Sehr <laughs> Shane Daniel. Bravo and thank you. Now I'd like to us to welcome Isabel Steeb, Rene Morel, and Zach Rogo. Isabel Steeb won nine literary awards in France, including the Prix Simon V for a book honoring a woman of action. She's also a journalist for the monthly La Terrasse and has worked in communication for many beloved French cultural institutions, including the Théâtre de l'Athénée, the Grand Palais, and the Comédie Française. René Morel, is a translator, native French speaker, and professor emeritus of French at City College of San Francisco. She lectures throughout the Bay Area on French culture, art, and civilization. Her other translations include Shipwrecked on a Traffic Island and other previously untranslated gems by Colette, also with Zach Rogo. Zach Rogo's translations from French include works by Colette, Georges Saint, André Breton, and Marcel Pagnol. He received the Penn Book of the Month uh, Club Translation Award and the Northern California Book Reviewers Award in Translation. He's the author, editor, and translator of 20 books or plays. Let's start with some words from our panelists. Who would like to speak first? René. Okay, yeah. Uh, my name is René Morel. Uh, I, I used to teach at City College of San Francisco, San Francisco State, and also a private school called the French class. As you said, I lecture throughout the Bay Area. Uh, I would like to add that I was born in, uh, uh, like Marguerite Duras, uh, in Saigon, in French Indochina. Uh, so that's my native country. But my parents left after you know, they lost the war in Bien Bien Phu, and Paris has become my home. Uh, under normal circumstances, in uh, every summer, I go to Paris, and I always go to a bookstore, my favorite independent bookstore, and uh, the owner, Philippe Lecomte, always recommends uh, new books uh, in pocket version, uh, for me to read with my French club at City College has been running for 12 years. So he heartily recommended uh, Berenice's book, uh, Isabel Stibb's book, I mean. And uh, he said, this is a great book. Your students will love it. And indeed they did. So I was sold. Uh, the book was a great success with my students right away. And uh, one of them, Maria Lindley, said, how come this book hasn't been translated yet? And I said, that's a good question. And she said, you must translate it. And uh, I contacted Zach, and uh, indeed, he was also sold. And uh, voila. <laughs> I would like to add that I'm, I don't speak Yiddish, and I'm not even Jewish. But I grew up in Paris or after we moved from Vietnam uh, near the Jewish district, the Chetong, uh, which was a uh, run down, I mean, not, not the fancy Marais that we know now. I've known the Marais when it was a bit poor and shabby. And, um, but I'm a, a fervent, what, philo Semite, <laughs> all those things. Thank you. Zach? 
Well, um, as Renee said, uh, her students love this book and they, they suggested that we translate it. It was kind of by popular acclaim. And uh, when I read the book, I, I just loved it because it's, it's, as you can see from Danielle's wonderful performance, and thank you, Danielle, for that fantastic interpretation of the text. That's, that's everything that a writer or a translator desires is to hear their words spoken so movingly. And it is such a moving book and it's funny. It's educational. You learn so much about what happened to the Jews in France and the Nazi occupation. And it made me think a lot to this book because Berenice has to make some very difficult choices. She becomes the leading ingenue actress in the Comédie Française, the leading theater in France. This is her life's goal. And yet um, no one knows she's Jewish because she's acting under a stage name and she has to make some, some heartbreaking decisions about uh, how she's going to um, react to, to what's happening all around her. And um, so kudos to Isabel for her wonderful book and, and what a privilege to be able to uh, bring her, her words into English. Great. And now a few words from the star of the afternoon. Isabel. I am sorry for my English, which is not very good. And uh, bravo to, to uh, Danielle uh, for her um, passionate uh, interpretation. I think Berenice is that kind of girl, very passionate. And uh, this, this was a problem. How, how can you do when you're a passionate person that uh, you, you, you love your, your, you love acting and what happened if you, if you are stopped uh, because of the war and because of uh, anti-Semitism. Um, well, it was uh, maybe the impulse of the, of the book. But, Isabel, this is your first book. Uh, have you always uh, wanted to be a novelist, or is this something that uh, yes and no. a sudden inspiration? <laughs> uh, you know, when I was uh, a child, I wanted to be an opera singer, uh, and at ten, I, I even wrote a, a libretto. Uh, <laughs> but today, I, uh, maybe I realized that it was my first uh, act of writing. Uh, but otherwise, at uh, 15, I, I, I wrote uh, a novel, and uh, since then, I, I, I wanted to be, to be a novelist. <laughs> and what inspired you to deal with these particular themes of uh, artistic and, and creative need for expression and identity? as a people and family? Uh, well, the first reason is that I worked at the Comédie Française. So I knew this uh, theater very well. And uh, when I uh, heard about uh, the exclusion of, the, of uh, the Jews during the occupation, I, I was so shocked. I want to dig uh, uh, into how uh, it would have been possible. And uh, the, the other reason, and maybe the, the deepest reason, is that uh, uh, I'm, I'm Jew and uh, my um, father uh, born in uh, 1929 and uh, he wore the, the yellow star when, we, when he was a child. So it's, um, uh, it's like a tribute uh, for, for him. Great. Zach and, and René, uh, you're well known for your Colette translations. How is it different working on a project written by a living writer that you could actually communicate with? It was, it was really great because we did have questions and of course we had some problems in the translation. Uh, sometimes we added, with, with Isabel's permission, we added a, a sentence, an expression, and uh, so, so as not to have footnotes, uh, so that readers would understand directly. Uh, for instance, for Philippe, the, so the, the, the man expects a child, 
And uh, uh, so, so if, it's, if it's a girl, she's going to be called Berenice, but if it's a boy, he's going to be Philippe. And um, it might not be obvious for an American audience that it refers to Pétain, so we had to explain this. And uh, also some, uh, the, the cabaret, uh, the Chahuan, we also changed the name because the, the horned owl was not very exciting <laughs> as a name for a cabaret. <laughs> And uh, we, we shorten, I think, some parts with names of many, many actors. So it was great to, to be able to ask, of course, permission from Isabella between Zach and I and her. I think also to have events like this is, is wonderful, to be able to, um, to be part of a, a, a community of readers and, and uh, people who love literature with Isabel is very, gratifying for a translator. I mean, I, I wish I could, could have known the, right, the other writers I've translated, like André Breton or Colette or Georges Sand. Um, so to actually make Isabelle's acquaintance even virtually is, is, a, is an honor. And for me, it was very exciting. <laughs> <laughs> it, uh, it, Isabel, it, in the epilogue of the book, you reveal that, uh, that your late father makes a brief cameo uh, in the book as a child. Did he read uh, Berenice as you were writing it? Uh, and if so, how did he feel about it? what were his thoughts? Well, he read the book um, uh, when I, uh, he, he read the manuscript uh, when I uh, was sending it uh, to publishers. And uh, unfortunately, it died just uh, before the book was released. Uh, but he knew uh, that the book uh, would have been published. So it's the most important. And he was very excited. And uh, he didn't say much about uh, the book, but he, he was very impressed uh, with the, document, the documentation. Uh, and, uh, you know, he, he was very modest um, with his... Uh, feelings. So I think it's why he, he didn't say much, but he was very really proud of me. <laughs> <laughs> With good reason. Uh, let, let me just say that uh, if people watching this have questions for the panelists, please write them in the chat. And uh, as we get closer, uh, we'll read the questions uh, to the, that you've submitted to the panelists. Uh, to go back to you, Isabel. I'm curious about the research that was involved in doing this book, particularly uh, many, if not most, of the supporting characters in the book are actually renowned figures of French theater and film of the period. And what sort of research did you do in order to be able to capture personalities, uh, ca characterizations, affects, uh, patterns of speech of these people that we've only, if we see them at all, it's only on screen playing a character? Mm -hmm. uh, I read a lot of books, uh, mm -hmm. and especially uh, books written by actors because um, actors write a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so autobiographies. And, and... Yes, many autobiographies. Um, and, uh, uh, and there exist uh, the, the files of uh, excluded Jew, Jew, Jews uh, at the Comédie Française, at the, li in the, at the library. You know, the, the files of the, the actors. So I went uh, these files, um, and also my my uh, father uh, wrote a ten pages text about his life, and uh, I picked up uh, some um, anecdotes and uh, uh, anecdotes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and then the imagination um, um, made the rest. Uh, Renee, uh, in the first part of the dramatic reading uh, that Daniel did for us, uh, Berenice makes a reference to Mademoiselle Rachel. 
Could you tell us who, uh, Rochelle, yes, could you tell us who that, uh, who, those of us who might not be familiar yeah. with her, uh, yes. she, she what her role was in French history? Okay, she, so she was a celebrated actress uh, who died of tuberculosis. Uh, she was 36, I believe. And uh, so uh, at the, during the Romantic era, uh, she was a mistress of quite a many famous men, including the emperor, Napoleon III, uh, also the illegitimate son of uh, Napoleon I, uh, Kolona Walewski, and uh, of many, many other men, just like uh, uh, Sarah Bernard later. And uh, she, she was a celebrated tragedian. Uh, she really wanted to speak with a, a, a more, with more veracity, more truthfulness, more uh, passion. And um, so she was just loved, and she, she was good looking besides. Uh, she's buried at the Père Lachaise, you can see her mausoleum. And uh, th there was a Jewish um, side uh, corner in the Père Lachaise at that time, but no, no longer. Rachel was also um, very much criticized by anti-Semites in the 19th century um, for being Jewish. They stereotyped her and made it sound as though she was only acting for money and it was a lot of very ugly criticism of her, and yet she was the most popular actress of her generation, I think. You're, you're saying that the uh, counter-reaction came centuries later, in, in the 19th century, not, not at the time that she was active? She was a 19th century actress, yes. Oh, she was 19th, oh, okay, got so it. So, and so it was simultaneously. The, the so when, when Bernice is trying to tell her parents, well, Rachel was Jewish, she was an actress. What's wrong with my becoming an actress? So she, she had that precedent to draw on. Right. Uh, so, with a bad personal reputation. She had a great reputation, right. as a, not as a woman. She was a lost woman. And I think it's not a coincidence uh, if Marcel Proust uh, called a character, uh, an actress, uh, Rachel. Mm -hmm. you, you, know, you see what I mean? Uh, dans, in uh, La Recherche du Temps Perdu, there is a character who is an actress and he called her Rachel. I, I think it's uh, because uh, he had in mind the real Rachel. In the book also, Isabel, uh, Moshe Kapolochnik changes his name to Maurice Kabel, mm -hmm. and his family speaks French at home, except for the occasional phrase, uh, Yiddish phrase. Was this typical for Jews? living in France at this time? I think it was, uh, but I think it was not only Jew, uh, Jews. Uh, even uh, later in the 50s, in the 60s, uh, many Italians, uh, for instance, uh, changed their, their name or uh, didn't, uh, refused to speak uh, their mother tongue language because of uh, assimilation, you know, of cultural assimilation. Uh, they wanted to be French. So uh, e even the, the, the name was changed and uh, the, they didn't want to speak um, Italian or Yiddish or uh, whatever with, uh, with their children. Today it's different. Uh-huh. <laughs> and, and, uh... A number of the characters, the family in the book, uh, use Yiddish words and phrases. Uh, were you familiar uh, with Yiddish, or was that a difference in generations? So that had disappeared. I mean, did you also hear those sort of Yiddish phrases in your home uh, I'm growing not up? Familiar. Uh, my um, grandmother, um, mother Stong, was Yiddish, but she claims that she had forgotten it. And so she spoke uh, uh, very good French. And sometimes uh, there are Yiddish words. And um, I know a, 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 a little uh, these words, like uh, uh, those um, uh, which are in the book, like uh, shiksa. <laughs> uh, <laughs> 
ähm, schleppen. <lacht> Great. Uh, I, I guess uh, we have a number of questions uh, from our audience and uh, let me present some of them to you now. Uh, from uh, Tela Zeslov. She asks, is this a true story? Did a French Jewish actress named Berenice actually exist during World mm -hmm. War II in France? Sorry, but, uh, no, it's, it's not yeah. a true story, but uh, it's based upon um, um, uh, some figures uh, who, ex who existed. But it's a mix between real people and uh, my imagination. Uh -huh. And Berenice, uh, who is uh, a fictional character, um, uh, meets real, um, real actors from this time, like uh, when, uh, Robert Manuel, uh, like Vera Cohen, you, you quoted. All right. Yes. Yeah, so reading the book, I kept going to uh, the database of movies and wondering which one was a character or not. And suddenly seeing the 20 films that all these characters made during this period, during the 1930s. And uh, it, it was very impressive. Uh, here's a question uh, from Tella. Uh, well, no, that's, that same, that's the same question. Uh, someone wants to know whether uh, was Sarah Bernhard Jewish uh, and asked whether she's mentioned in the novel. Uh, she is, of course. Uh, but do you know whether Sarah Bernhard was Jewish? Uh, I think she was. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Other questions? She might have converted to Catholicism at the end of her life, if I remember right. But she was certainly born and raised Jewish. Jewish. Uh-huh. Uh, a question I, I have, it gets to the heart of it, uh, uh, Isabel, is what, what's the one thing uh, you'd like readers to learn from reading this novel? Well, when I started to, to write a book, I really wanted to, the readers um, to know uh, the, what happened during the occupation in the theaters, because it's, it's not very, very, it's still secret. And especially with the Comédie Française, what, uh, what happened uh, with, with the Jews, uh, so I wanted, I wanted um, uh, readers to, to know about, about it. And today I think I, I would like uh, them to understand we must be very careful. Uh, and you know, there is this uh, quotation from uh, Bertrand Brecht uh, in French, it's uh, Le ventre est encore fécond, d'où a surgi la bête immonde. So in, uh, in, um, in English, I think it's uh, the belly is still fertile from which the fall best sprung. So it's, um, well, <laughs> that's what I, I wanted to readers uh, to understand. Interesting. Well, I think uh, that's about all the time uh, that we have. Uh, so I want to thank you, uh, Daniel, Isabel, Rene, and Zach for sharing Berenice, 1933 to 44, an actress in occupied Paris. We'll post a purchase link for this book in the chat. I think it's already up there if you want to take a look. And uh, to the assembled, if you enjoyed today's program, I hope you'll participate in future Worker Circle events. Our next Zoom program is Courageous Conversations Reclaim Our Vote. It's going to be held on Thursday, October 15th at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. Join us to learn how the Center for Common Ground is fighting back against voter suppression in communities of color across the South, and how you can join with the Workers' Circle in this crucial work prior to the 2020 elections. Thank you all for 
your attention and uh, have a great day.